My name is Carmi Palafox, an urban planner and economist. Welcome to Beyond Places, the podcast about the planning, design, and leadership of the communities and cities that we call home. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Places. I am super excited to speak to our next guest. Um, I'd have to say he's really the biggest influence to me in terms of my personal life as well as um, my career path in terms of becoming an urban planner and my passion with places. So our guest is an architect and urban planner. So he has been practicing architecture for 48 years and urban planning for 46 years. He and his company have a global footprint in terms of um, places designed and shaped in 40 countries. Welcome to the show, Architect June Palafox. Yeah, thank you, Carmi. Yeah, architecture simply defined is the design of buildings and structures. And urban planning, environmental planning, or town and country planning, it's the uh, ordering the land use, put order into the land use of cities, communities, and the circulation route uh, around it good circulation, of course, including the utilities like water supply, drainage, uh, transportation, and so on. Anything that are components of a city or community. And my profession, it's a noble profession, I must say, architecture and urban planning, because it has brought me to two projects in 40 countries. And it also brought me to be invited as a guest speaker, resource speaker, in 20 countries, including Harvard and MIT, Russia, and many places that uh, not many people, people go. So I think my architectural practice and my urban planning practice has really helped me uh, uh, also continuously uh, improve on my, the practice of my profession. In architecture and urban planning, I would say it's like the, the art and science of pacemaking. And architecture used to be just uh, the art and science, but now it includes technology, economy, political, social, and so on. So, so it's urban planning. But Palafox, Palafox Architecture Group and Palafox Sources, I have put forward since we started in 1989, our, our overarching guidelines. People first, or planet Earth, then and planet Earth, so people first or social equity, then planet Earth or the environment, then we can talk about profits, uh, economic goals, prosperity. I've added also uh, culture, history, and heritage, and interfaith spirituality. And the overarching guideline is pro Deo, patria, et terra, for God, country, and planet Earth. What do you think led you to pursue this career path in placemaking? Yeah, I think uh, the back of my mind, it really reminded me when I was name hired and invited to be an architect and urban planner for Dubai in April 1977, where you, Carmi, was born there. And, and it, it reminded me in my childhood because me and my siblings was a uh, my, my parents' house were across the church with uh, one of the tallest bell tower in, in the Philippines. It's right across the church. So I, I, it's really an uh, uh, overwhelming sight when you're a little child. And on weekends, and I go to church, we went to church every day because it's across the parents' home. On weekends, uh, we go to the beach, and some children will make uh, sand castles. I would make cities and communities with waterway, bridges, mountains, valleys, and plains. I remember that. So when I was uh, invited in to go to Dubai, that may have influenced me to, to take up architecture. But my first vocation was priesthood, maybe because of the everyday going to church. So I thought I had a vocation. So four years, I was trained by the divine world missionaries, mostly Germans, and some Americans, at Christ taking seminary, in Quezon City. And then when I was in third year, I was appointed as librarian. So I read a lot of books and our German professors, European professors and American professors, mentors, they would talk about the architecture of great cathedrals and great buildings and so on. And in fourth year, 
I made a discernment and maybe priesthood was not for me. So, uh, the choices were uh, take up medicine like my, my father, doctor, and my elder sister, or engineer like my uncle, and architecture. So finally, I decided to take up architecture. It's, uh, I think it was a good decision. And for urban planning, um, there was a scholarship program scholarship sponsorship by the United Nations Development Program at the University of the Philippines. And uh, fortunately, I, I won. I got the full scholarship for my master's degree. And, and again, fortunately, for, then I was required to work for government projects at least two years uh, upon my graduation. And fortunately, again, I worked with visionary leaders and technocrats. So the, uh, the president of UP that time, Dr. Odi Corpus, then EPSA, uh, it was a new innovation for export zones and Department of Public Works, Transportation and Communications, uh, another visionary, David Kutsudhi. And they assigned me in UNDP funded projects and World Bank uh, funded projects. And longest time that I, I work on a project was uh, Metro Planning, Metro Manila Transport Land Use Development Planning Projects. And we had about more than 20 experts uh, from uh, Freeman Fox and Associates of London and Hong Kong. And these experts in urban planning, transportation, the built environment, they helped do the planning in London, of London, Hong Kong, and Singapore and Kuala Lumpur. So the Metro Plan that we work on was, uh, I'd like to believe it was one of the best metro plans in the world. Unfortunately, they were not implemented. And while I was still uh, working as a team leader and senior planner for Metro Plan Manila, some people from Dubai uh, learned about me and Sultan Khalifa of Dubai came to the Philippines to interview me on December 1976. But I have a contract to finish the Metro Plan until April 1977. And they waited for me. I was invited and named hard. And, and that's when I, my first international assignment as an expatriate was in Dubai. We were uh, about 20 expatriates, uh, mostly Europeans, some Americans. And I was the only Southeast Asian and the youngest. And uh, I'm uh, Part of the contract was uh, wife has two children. At that time, only had one child. Carmi was born born in Dubai. You, Carmi, you were born in Dubai. And again, while we're in Dubai, we're encouraged to go around the world and take inspirations from the best practices in the world. Because Sheikh Rashid bin Said al Maktoum told us expat uh, or the planners, engineers, architects that were working for Dubai to bring Dubai well into the 21st century in 15 years. Design Dubai as if there's no oil. Uh, and what else? Make Dubai as a pace setter city in the Middle East and North Africa, setting the pace. And the other one is create a garden city out of the desert. And Dubai was importing garden soil from Pakistan, irrigation from Germany, flowers from Holland, now it's very well landscaped. And I think in less than 15 years, they, they joined the first world the status, City Emirate. And one thing I like very much was really uh, going around the world with my family to not just to visit, but to observe cities. And until now, I do that. And I think my profession has brought me to, of course, to do projects in 40 countries, speak engagement in 20 countries, and to visit and observe more than 1,000 cities in 72 countries and, and seven territories. And it's a goal even in our family, Carmi, if you remember, I challenge all of us that for every year of your age, you must have visited the same number. So I just turned 70 years old this year, and I've been to 72 countries and seven territories. So I'm so glad I took up architecture. And architecture is, uh, is really 
should be something unique, memorable, and identifiable, and you identify with it. So architecture and urban planning is not just man use. People use it, uh, men use it, but it's also man appreciated, and so on. So it, what emotions you evoke? Is this building overwhelming, welcoming? Uh, you feel happy or you feel overwhelmed? And how does this building relate to the community, the context, the city? And every building we design, just like Rockwell, Master Rockwell and architecture, the first five towers, we did not just plan it like an island. How it contributes to the, the neighborhood, the community, Makati and Metro Manila. So it's really, uh, we plan in context. Uh, we plan with connectivity, convergence. You were very young when you were hired and um, moved to Dubai to work for the municipality. If I recall, you were just 27 years old. And yeah, I was invited when I was 26, yeah. So you, okay, and then you left, um, you were just 31. So it's very young when we think about it now. And you had two young kids, and yet you chose to um, go back to the Philippines. Why is that? Yeah. One of them, uh, Leslie Soul, the late Henry C., visited our home in Dubai because he was in the Intercontinental Hotel and there were Filipino expats, uh, managers of the hotel in Dubai. And he asked, Mr. C. asked them what the rapid modernization in Dubai. And they told him there's a young architect helping the development of Dubai. Henry C. went to our house and he said, should you decide to come home, there's a job waiting for you. He gave me a job and the architecture of seven SM malls, including SM China. And there was another guy, the late Enrique Sobel, uh, uh, that Ayala executives also visited Dubai. So they asked for my CV. So Henry C. then Ayala, and I was uh, head of their technical planning group, chief architect, chief Chief urban planner. And I see the Philippines as uh, also as has a very high development potential. And, and uh, we, if you rotate the map of the world, I tell people, the Philippines is right in the center. Because ever since from kindergarten, they put the Philippines in the Far East because maps were, were first uh, established by Europe. So the Philippines are Far East. And I say, for more than 350 years, 350 years or so, we were the Asia Pacific hub of Spanish Europe and Acapulco, Mexico. So Europe and the Americas, we are the, uh, we are the Asia Pacific hub. And more than 50 years, the Americans, four years, the Japanese, two years, the British. So I say, all superpower countries, we always be interested in our beautiful islands and because of its strategic location. And also I say that we have so many uh, things going for us. We're number one in the world in marine biodiversity, number one. We're now number one in the world in sailors, seafarers. We're number one in the world in call centers. We're number two in the world in geothermal energy. We're number two in the world in BPOs. We have the third or fifth coastline in the world, longer than uh, mainland USA. In some countries, they go to war because they don't have a waterfront. Like the two world wars, one and two, some countries in Europe wanted the waterfront of the Atlantic Ocean. And relatively recently, Iraq invaded Kuwait because Kuwait is blocking the waterfront of Iraq. And in Dubai, uh, they have limited natural waterfront. I think if you remember, it's only 70 kilometers. So Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of Dubai today, created the man-made Palm Islands, and they, they dredge canals like rivers and creeks for artificial waterfront. And I was in Dubai also when Sheikh Rashid, uh, the ruler and founder of modern Dubai at that time, uh, made the decision to, to carve out of the desert the largest man-made harbor in the world. So everything in Dubai was uh, larger, number one, and, and so on. 
So it's always drive for excellence. So I, I think I've been very fortunate to have worked with visionary men and uh, uh, leading countries and, and, and corporations. And uh, so we're number three in the world. And we're also number four in the world in shipbuilding, thanks to the Japanese and the Koreans. And we're also number four in gold. Dubai has no gold, but they export more gold than us. They import and they export. Uh, so gold and shipbuilding, we're number four. We're number five in the world in, in uh, all other mineral resources. And we are number 12 in the world in human resources. And the Filipino expatriates, let's not call them OFW, Filipino expatriates are the preferred employees of kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers, uh, uh, cruise ships, schools, developers, and hospitals. So we have great things going for us. So when I was the first architect to be elected president of the Management Association of the Philippines, the theme that I put forward was developing a culture of integrity, addressing corruption, criminality, and climate change. If we can address those three uh, challenges, we should be in the top 20 economies of the world. And I added also, the Philippines is 400 times the size of Singapore, 350 times the size of Hong Kong, eight times the size of Taiwan, three times the size of South Korea. And until the 70s, from the 1930s to the 70s, we were number two in Asia, second only to Japan. And what happened, I think one of them is plans that were put forward a long time ago, that metro plan. In fact, we said that time, the team, not just me, that with the do nothing scenario, Metro Manila will have catastrophic traffic, catastrophic flooding, cannot address garbage problem, uh, clean water, sewerage, and not prepare for disasters. If you could name, let's say, 10 um, adjectives that you hope when people describe Philippine cities, um, you know, in the next 10 years, they would be using those words. You've already said democratic, inclusive. Inclusive. What, what else would you add in that list? Healthy, livable, resilient, uh, sustainable, smart, better connected, integrating places to live, work, shop, dine, learn, and worship with 24-hour cycle activities, cross-generational and mixed income. And just like the mayor of Paris is doing that now, 15-minute city. Everything you need should be within 15-minute walking distance, bicycle, and public transit. Because Metro Manila, the way it is today, is how not to do it. Metro Manila. Because we're still using the what we got from the, of course, the loss of the Indies given to us by the Spaniards, Spanish, is that you have a, a long plaza, the church, and the, the city hall, town hall, with a big park. The downside of it was only the Illustrandos in Principalia, the rich, powerful, and very well connected, were close to the town plaza and the church. The peasants, the Indus, were far away. It's the intramurus inside the walls, extramurus outside the walls. So even intramurus, the Principalia Illustrados were inside the walls of intramurus, inside the walls. Extramurus were the peasants, the Indios, and the Sanglais. Sanglais were Chinese merchant. If you look at our obsolete zoning in the Philippines, it's exclusionary zoning. Exclude the poor, exclude the middle class, and so on. That's why uh, the Makati Central Business District is again how not to do it. Because Makati Central Business District, Ortiga Center, Fort Bonifacio, uh, it's a center of jobs and economic activity. But the employees of these business districts are priced out of the housing stock. So I said also that, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not the only one who said that, that employees of uh, these job centers, major activity centers, are like, expatriates or OFWs in Metro Manila because they are spent five, six hours a day in traffic. So they are five to six hours away from their families. And 
in income inequality, addressing poverty, and so on. One of my term papers in UP, uh, I wrote, development is not worthy of the name unless it's spread evenly like butter on a piece of bread. And because even this pandemic, it made us realize that the urban poor, they live in about nine square meters uh, homes in the informal settlers. And the urban rich may be in those nine square meters per home with five family members. So less than two square meters per person. So how can you have a two meter social distancing? Whereas in the urban reach, 100, 200, 300, or maybe even 500 square meters per person. So that's the challenge. And maybe convincing also those gated communities to open up their gates. And like Etsa Corridor is again, a, a good example of, a, of a how not to do it. It's a corridor, 37 kilometers, have 13 transit stations, MRT, surrounded by low density gated communities and, and gated military camps. Elsewhere in the world, you would have maybe 15 minute walk to the uh, transit station, higher density. So you have more people within walkable distance to that. And I said, it's a corridor, is equivalent to eight roads because it's a corridor is functioning as a major artery, minor arterial road, uh, major collector road, minor collector road, shopping center access road, residential access road, military camp access road, and what have you. It's all in one corridor. So I've been proposing for the longest time elevated walkways and bicycle lanes, uh, skyways, because it's, uh, it's not safe to walk anymore or bike. And along that uh, 37 kilometers elevated walkway, you can have vendors, so you have more eyes in the public realm. Those criminals are more scared when there are more eyes in the public realm. They're not scared of high walls, concrete walls, because you can throw a grenade, no witnesses. You can commit criminality inside, no witnesses. So we have so many obsolete practices that we have to re-educate even our leaders of government and industry. So your question was uh, how many now to describe uh, cities of the future. And another challenge is, I think by, by 2050, we'll have, I think, 40 to 50 million more Filipinos. Where will they go? So I've been saying we'll probably need uh, 100 new towns or 50 cities. Because where will people go? They will congest some more Metro Manila and our existing cities. So these are challenges. That's why our plans also for our an architecture with this pandemic is now reshaping our cities, buildings, and spaces. So it's a good opportunity again, like we should have uh, more sunlight and natural ventilation. So even the, the buildings and hotels we're doing now architecturally, we have more balconies, more fresh air, and less enclosed spaces. Even restaurants have been we have 400 rivers in the country. 180 of them are dead. So our advocacy also is, uh, create uh, promenades for uh, and linear parks along the waterways, like we had proposed. Promenades, bicycle lanes, and linear park along the 250 kilometer waterfront of Laguna Lake after dredging it and, and, and uh, addressing the flooding and the 27 kilometer uh, um, Pasig River, again, uh, a promenade along the river. So you can shame the polluters, protect the river for polluters and reorient the buildings to face the river, just like what, how we designed Rockwell. And, and the 190 kilometer uh, Bayfront, Manila Bay Walk, and a combination of linear parks, mangroves and so on. So there are so many opportunities in our country, and I hope um, architects, urban planners are listened to as well as the other professions. So there's a lot to, to do in possibilities. There's a lot of possibilities in our country. And, and another sweet spot is we have a young uh, population. That's another sweet spot. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Carmi.
Thank you for that answer. I wanted to talk about um, some of the projects, uh, architecture um, specifically of um, Palafox Associates and Palafox Architecture Group. So earlier you mentioned how your time in the seminary in your younger years really influenced um, you know, how you practice architecture and urban planning. And you've been involved in some of the most notable um, places of worship. Can we talk about them? Maybe let's start with the Masjid in Mindanao. Yeah, Masjid, uh, the, the largest mosque in the country, funded by the Sultan of Brunei. I'm not a Muslim, so I was pleasantly surprised and privileged to be appointed to be the principal architect in, in Palafox Architecture, Palafox Sausage. So the masjid, place of worship for the Muslims in Cotabati City, it's now, I've seen it in postcards and magazines. So again, the principles of uh, uh, cross ventilation and natural lighting. And of course, the Islamic architecture, we have to study that. And even in the Middle East, we've conceptually designed many places of worship, like mosque or masjid and, and, and musallas, the large open, open space uh, places of worship. And we've done also the, the near Moa, the, the church there, and several uh, uh, seminaries. And even right now, uh, we're doing seminaries and other places of work for, uh, for different faiths. So, Muslims, Catholics, and other Christian, uh, Christian religious organizations like CCF, uh, uh, Jesus Lord, and others. We've also done places of worship in the Holy Land, innovation of a big church of the Greek Orthodox Church, place of worship in Palestine, and Israel, Jaffa. What was the you know, the design thinking and process around it? Because I understand uh, you led, it was started with the, sorry, it started with the master plan. Um, so how, what did you consider um, in terms of, you know, the local context and what did you want to highlight about um, Cotabato and in terms of the ability of um, people there to be able to worship in this masjid that's now built? Yeah. I hope that it will be uh, the masjid. Uh, is, masjid is place of worship. We should not call it mosque. It's not the right term for that. And it will be a major activity center and not just a place of worship. It has a, in a park-like setting. In fact, the future plans is we put also madrasas, uh, Muslim schools. So uh, uh, it can, there's a better understanding the Islamic faith, uh, which is, I've read the Quran and the, the Bible. There's a lot of similarities uh, there. And it's now becoming also a, a tourist destination in Cotabato. And, and uh, I think it, it, it's now a landmark in Cotabato. And even non-Muslims, they, they go there. And we have, it's also inclusive, like, even if segregated men and women worshipers were able to design it that it's also inclusive and respecting the, the customs of the Islamic faith. Your company um, is highly regarded around the world and um, it was the first Southeast Asian and Filipino company to make it in the World Architecture Magazine list of top 100 firms. And specifically, it ranked number eight at some point in terms of uh, number one in leisure architecture. What are some of your uh, project highlights in terms of um, leisure projects you've been involved in? Uh, leisure, of course, the, the places where I master planning for, for, for tourism. And we have worked with, I think we're probably the only architects or planners who have worked with Jack Nicklaus for Manila Southwoods. Robert Trent Jones for Santa Elena Calls, uh, uh, Tom Weisskopf for the Country Club, and Greg Norman for Splendido, and also with, again, Jack Nicklaus in the John Hay in Baguio, and Forest Hills, and also a proposed golf course in Vietnam. So these are golf course communities. 
We've also designed uh, clubhouses houses like the reno renovation and rehabilitation and modernization of Manila Polo Club, very high-end club. And sports stadium, we also designed them. And also plazas. And, and again, uh, beach resorts, mountain resorts, hotels, uh, tourism uh, restaurants. And that's probably made us recognized as one of the top 10 architects in the world for leisure and tourism oriented projects and number 89 among the, the world's top architects when we made it at the first Southeast Asian firm to make it to the top 100. And earlier than that, the first Filipino firm to make it into the top 500, ranking number 220. What are your thoughts on golf courses? So in Australia, for example, where I am right now, the golf courses here are the busiest they've been in years because it's a very good sport for social distancing and people have more time um, with work from home. Do you think they're good to keep or will they be changing? Will, be, will there be more of them or less of them in the coming years? I hope we'll have more of them, but more inclusive again, because most of the golf courses we have are privatized. And there were also golf courses that I, I was tasked to work at the master plan, convert them into other land uses. Like Capitol Hills, supposed to be the third and fourth nine, became Ayala Heights. And the Cebu Business Park used to be a golf course in Cebu. And now it's the central business district in Cebu. And golf courses are criticized as eating up so much urban land resources. But the positive thing about it is that uh, rainwater, they park percolate to the ground to recharge the underground aquifers. Uh, Reimagine Metro Manila without those golf courses. Maybe it, it would have become roofs and in concrete. With these uh, open spaces, we, we, it actually helps uh, uh, prevent more flooding and recharging the underground underground aquifers. And I, I hope future golf courses should be open up for everybody. Not just the heads, but maybe even for the head sums and the head nuts to be able to play golf. Yeah. How about um, some of the commercial offices, business parks and industrial parks um, that you've designed? Uh, can you talk about some of them? Yeah, uh, first Philippine Industrial Park in, in Batangas. It's, it's, uh, I think it became fully occupied, so we were hired again to do the, the next phases. And we included there not just place to work, but place to live as well, and hotels. And we designed the first 70 buildings there, including the, I think about five or seven uh, administrative building, conferencing, emergency for fire station and post office. And, and more than 60 standard warehouses, we designed them for them. And, and uh, our clients were the first uh, Philippine Holdings and, and Somitomo of Japan. So we were, we were required to follow Japanese standards. And several uh, business parts, industrial parts after that. And even before that, that uh, I was part of industrial estate planning, not just here, but elsewhere in the world. How do you think um, industrial parks and business parks are changing in terms of design? Because you know how in a, f a few years ago, the model was like a Silicon Valley type um, campus in the middle of suburban area or in the middle of a totally new township. But I recall you saying that they should all be mixed use as well. Um, is it possible to mix industrial uses with, for yeah. example, retail and um, yeah. other uses? Our plan for the smart city of Clark Freeport Zone. It's also Aerotropolis Airport Living City, but uh, different uh, created seven districts. One of them is an uh, industrial district, also mixed use development. And even the business park, all mixed use. Again, integrating places to live, workshop, and dine 
learn and worship with wellness and health and healthcare facilities and with 24 hour cycle activity centers. The current project that I forgot to mention is Leyte Ecological uh, Industrial Park Zone in, in Leyte. Uh, Isabel Leyte and, and uh, the environment, green environment is part of the master plan. And we've been asked also to, to help provide guidelines for, for environment friendly industrial parks. And again, we could, we, that could also be a 15 minute community, 15 minute city. Everything you need on a daily basis is within 15 minutes uh, walking, bicycles, and biking. You've also been involved in the master plan of places for the not living anymore, cemeteries. And I thought yeah. it was interesting that um, you've been advocating, quote unquote, mixed use for, for memorial parks and cemeteries as well. Yeah. In fact, we had a project in Minglanilla, Cebu. And I told our clients that that's not when their matriarch were still alive. So it's supposed to be a memorial park. And I told them it should be a park for the departed and the living and all generations. Like make this, uh, uh, this park as uh, everything, place of worship, place of recreation, like even, even some restaurants and then maybe some recreation for the teenagers. So they visit the place at least every weekend and create events. There are 52 weekends in the year and plus Christmas and Holy Week and Easter, great events. Our, our, our cemeteries are visited only maybe twice a year, the birthdays of the departed and All Souls Day, All Saints Day. So make it a, even a 24 hour cycle activity centers, make it attractive even for children to go there. And, and the, it, on top of a hill, very nice panoramic view of the sea and the mountains. So I said, instead of the, of the dearly departed enjoying the panoramic view, <laughs> let everybody enjoy the panoramic view. And then it's on top of a mountain, and there are also mountains and hills beyond. Maybe in the future, let's put aerial cable cars. Yeah. And even in the future, maybe uh, thinking aloud uh, well into the future, even the, from the highway, maybe you put like a conveyor belt and escalator to put the coffin with the, con uh, with the conveyor belt, with escalators going up the mountain. So activate the place. Yeah, because in other areas like New Orleans, they are uh, ghost tours at night. So the, 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 in the locals, we call them Campo Santo, in that cemetery. Holy, holy land, holy camp. The Ilocanos call it Campo Santo. So, big use activated as much practicable 24 hour cycle activity centers. Even the cementarios, the Campo Santo. So, going back to um, urban planning of, of the cities in the Philippines, particularly Manila, a comment that people usually say is. Um, you know, it's so complex already and it will be difficult to, um, you know, replan and redevelop considering how dense it is and the big share of the population that, that's below the poverty line. But there were other cities that were able to do it. So to you, what are comparable cities that are good examples that um, cities in developing countries can look at in terms of, you know, being able to address um, vulnerabilities from disasters and whatnot, and then using their strengths yeah. to elevate the quality of yeah. life of its people. I believe, strongly believe, after epidemics and disasters, cities bounce back. But we have to do something. Just like European cities, then there was the plague, the epidemics, they improved their their sanitary system, sewerage system, water supply. In the U.S., they created the, the Central Park and created more parks because parks and open spaces are the lungs of the city and it also helps our immunization and, and, and so on. 
So for Metro Manila to bounce back, let's correct the mistakes and improve our uh, sanitation and public health. And, and again, in making it better connected, more bikeable, more, more walkable, and having more green buildings, green infrastructure, uh, green architecture, and so on. So there's opportunity. In fact, every week I write about it, how to bounce back our cities. And again, this pandemic is giving us the opportunity to correct the mistakes and under the mistakes and uh, opportunity to bring in as much as practicable best practices elsewhere in the world, especially those big fires in San Francisco, in Chicago, epidemics in European cities, and so on. What cities in other quote-unquote developing countries do you think are, are doing some things right? Singapore. Our, That's developed our, though. Uh, develop, develop countries. developing countries, yeah. Is is uh, Malaysia developing country almost there? Kuala Lumpur, hmm, not sure. I think they're doing it right. Vietnam, they seem to be controlling this pande- pandemic, and even Myanmar, I heard, are, are doing a good job. And interestingly. Uh, women leaders are doing better. <laughs> New Zealand, Germany, whereas <laughs> Taiwan. And interestingly, yeah. And and I think what we should do really is, especially the professional and civic organizations, especially built environment uh, organizations, we should do uh, advocacy collectively, not as individuals. To, implement really more more environment friendly communities and cities and address really not just flooding, earthquake, and all of that. And I said in my my Senate hearing that I was invited last Wednesday, it's 90% cheaper or 90% less expensive than post-disaster rehabilitation if we address the 18 hazards before they become disasters. And I said, for every peso you invest for, for prevention, it's nine peso savings. Aside from, aside from saving more lives, uh, uh, infrastructure, agriculture, and real estate properties, by addressing, there are 18 kinds of hazards, 10 man-made and eight natural. And the Philippines, I think, is the third most vulnerable country in the world. And maybe Metro Manila would be the most vulnerable. Yeah. And we, we already know the hazards. We already know the solutions. Maybe just take uh, political will, visionary leadership, good appreciation of good urban planning, good appreciation of good design, like architecture, engineering, good governance, good management. And that's what I saw in leaders in the world, like our boss in Dubai before, Sheikh Razi, the ruler of Dubai. I saw that in Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore and leaders of the Scandinavian countries. I recall you would say um, quite often that, you know, it's really the century of the cities. So before when people talked about, you know, um, the economy or whatnot. They talk about countries, but now it's really more about um, towns and cities. Um, what are you most um, excited about in terms of opportunities uh, in the next few years for towns and cities? Yes, there's no opportunity to... Yeah, uh, you're right. The last century was century of nations, maybe because of the United Nations. This century will be century of cities. And with the rapid urbanization, I think half of the world's population live in cities. By 2050, I think, uh, if I remember it right, the forecast, 70% will be urban dwellers. So there's a great opportunity now to, to look at possibilities of creating new towns. As I said, maybe we'll need uh, 100 new towns or, or 50 new cities the next 30 years. And since nobody, I'm not aware 
any government agency is doing that right now. So we've been advocating for that. I, I write about it. And we, we can, like I said, we are Philippines is 400 Singapore's. We can have 400 Singapore's in the Philippines or 350 Hong Kong's and, and, and so on. So among our cities uh, and, and again, it's possibilities and great opportunity to develop our cities and address the, because planning is balance in balance with it, job locations and housing locations, like in Metro Manila, and the parasitic relationship between the cities and the rural areas, urban areas and the, the farms. And I'm hoping that it will be like a metropolis include urban farming, suburban farming, even rooftop farming, and so on. And some, some of the projects we've done, like in India and Vietnam, which we're doing some of them in the Philippines now, like in Mindanao, and Cavite, and, and Bulacan, and Laguna, um, and kitchen gardens, kitchen gardens, so the concept of, again, agropolis. And, and I think this, this uh, pandemic has shown us that the three needed uh, industries right now is food, food security, healthcare, and, and uh, digital infrastructure. Because we're, we're talking about Balik Provincia, regional development, addressing the primacy of Metro Manila. As you know, primacy, primate city is not a healthy development. Where a primate city is more than 10 times larger than the second biggest city and so on. Metro Manila, I think, controls uh, 30, 40 percent of our economy, and Island of Luzon, 70 percent of our economy. So again, planning is balanced, not balanced. In the 70s, we already talk about regional development and uh, more balanced national development. There's a program of government now on going back to the provinces, Balik Provincia, in our in our language, and without good digital infrastructure it may not be that effective. Because with digital infrastructure, just like your, your sister, instead of having her clinic in Makati Medical Center, she set up a clinic in Siargao and doing telemedicine. But sometimes the, the internet, the Wi-Fi is not available. So if we improve our digital infrastructure, I think people can not just work from home, but work from the beach, work from the resorts, work from the mountain resorts and so on. You don't have to be in Metro Manila. So digital infrastructure is very important. Healthcare facilities. That's why during this pandemic, you donate, we donated our architectural designs for COVID centers, converting basketball courts, for COVID centers to the congest, the, the hospitals. And, and in fact, other countries in the world gratefully appreciate that we donated our design, for COVID centers, because the Philippines, I think we only have 1,400 hospitals. With 107 million Filipinos, we need at least 5,000 hospitals. So, and, and some open spaces, parts and open spaces. Uh, more progressive cities in the world like Singapore, Shanghai, other cities, as the population grows, the open spaces grow. And in Metro Manila, I was, I, I, I was abroad, we were abroad when the 1979 Metro Manila zoning ordinance was put in place. You compare the open spaces there and the open spaces today. Unfortunately, there are approvals of reclassifying parts and open spaces to be buildable, sellable. I cannot think of any other city in the world that sells parts and open spaces. And again, the more democratic, uh, inclusive transportation. And, and we've been proposing greenways, elevated walkways, and pedestrian bicycle bridges across our waterways like Pasig, San Juan, uh, Pasig River, San Juan River, and Marikina Rivers. And if all our waterways, even just pedestrian bicycle bridges, I think people will, will, uh, will walk and bike. And we also design healthy cities because uh, we know 
As adults, we must walk at least 10,000 steps a day. That's about seven kilometers a day. Here where we live and work in Makati, I think I, work on, I walk only 2,000 steps a day before the pandemic. But in places like, uh, like cities in Europe, even Australia, uh, Manhattan, New York, I, I walk 14 kilometers a day as long as that. That's 20,000 steps a day. So if we improve, make our cities more walkable and bikeable, environment friendly, I think people will, will walk. If you put trees along the, the sidewalk, I think people will walk. So these are the, the least, of course, smart cities as well. Uh, I, I, I was a guest speaker a while ago this morning on the Association of Electrical Engineers. And, and I told them that uh, if we, we make our alternative energy alternatives and put our overhead wires under the sidewalks, every typhoon we have uh, dung, dung, uh, dangling wires. And they are even dangerous and they are visually obtrusive. They're so ugly. And one of, the, one of the things we're doing also is when we're not too busy and also part of our projects, when we, we take pictures of the uglification of our cities and we do architectural perspectives, uh, urban design perspectives, how they should look like from the uglification today and call it, we call it postcards from the future. But instead of complaining in narratives, in words, we show it in architectural perspectives. I think it's more effective. And by doing that, in fact, we have, uh, uh, we had clients after that. Thank you so much. I enjoyed speaking with you, Dad. Thanks for yeah. still being so passionate about recreating um, great places um, all throughout the Philippines and internationally. Thank you, Carmi. Thank you for affirming me. And you have been asking intelligent questions. So you already got half the answers because of your intelligent questions. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share and, and take care, God bless you. And stay safe, sane, healthy, and happy. Bye for now. Bye, bye for now. It's nice to see you and talk to you, Dad. Take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Beyond Places. I would love to hear from you. Feel free to connect with me on social media and carmipalafox at gmail.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please do subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Bye and see you again next week.